Can everyone hear me at the back? Bab, hi there. Um, so I'm Sanjay, I've just chose down all my intros, so um, hi, I'm Sanjay. <laughs> uh, um, I work for On Hands, and On Hands, uh, just like Joe described, we're uh, um, uh, a tool to engage employees in doing eco and social good. Yes, we've won a lot of awards. Um, the recent one was um, the best tool for engaging your employees in volunteering. So, really delighted to be here uh, speaking to you today. So, we're speaking about uh, perks with purpose. Um, and so, why? why? Why are we speaking about Perks with Purpose? And first test, can I use the tech here today? Let's see. Yay, okay. So, um, great resignation. I'm sure lots of people in the room, or maybe everyone in the room, and I include myself in that everyone, has had their organisation impacted by the great resignation. Probably read loads of stats, and people over there may not be able to see the screen, but the screen says, hey, uh, I think it says seven out of ten. Seven out of ten employees are thinking about leaving right now. Um, you've probably read other stats on this. You've probably seen it in your own organisations. I think I read another stat recently, which is one in four, twenty-five percent of employees actually quit last year in the US. It was a US study, but I think the trends and some of the findings in it are really applicable over here as well. Um, and what was quite staggering about those stats is um, people were leaving even if they didn't have another job to go to which is mental, like, what's going on out there? This is a, like a giant change, a, a change that I think only happens once in a generation that's going on in work right now. And one of the first things I wanted to say is, like, um, I don't think anyone's got all the answers to what's going on right now. Um, and maybe, perhaps reassuringly for everyone in the room, like, if you, if you think you should know all the answers, like, anyone that thinks they knows all the answers to this right now, they have no idea. No one's got any, any idea. We're all trying to figure it out at the same time. Um, if someone thinks they have all the ideas, tell, tell me later. Um, <laughs> but maybe just, just reassurance on the point that um, we're all trying to figure this out uh, right now, and it's, it's affecting all, like, all organisations, uh, you know, including, including mine. Um, I'll keep going. Oh, I can't work out the technology. That one. Um, so why should we care? And there's some financial stuff on why we should care. Hey, the cost for uh, replacing employees, the, yeah, there's a, there's a cost for replacing employees, and you've probably seen other stats as well, these are glass door stats on the cost to replace them, an individual employee, and then the time to replace an individual employee. But for me, some of those financial stats are a bit beside the point too. Um, yes, you've probably seen these stats, and you've probably seen stats that go beyond this that say, hey, if you, if you lose an employee in lost productivity, the cost to replace, in ramping someone up, actually the cost is nearer like 30 grand per employee, so it's a massive cost when you lose an employee. Um, but when you combine that with the stuff that was before, if seven out of ten of your employees left tomorrow, hey, you've got a giant, like, it's, it's not, it's almost beyond, uh, well, it's, it's, it massively impacts the money, but, like, there's your culture, your culture's just walked out the door, your whole organisation almost has walked out the door and you've got to start from scratch. So there's, there's, whilst I've got the financials here, there's something different going on about um, uh, the employees and uh, the great resignation, how big impact it can be. So why are we talking about purpose today? Um, so there's a lot of issues going on in the world, right? There's a lot of issues going on in the world, and the reality is I care about them, I'm sure all of you care about them, the reality is all of your employees care about them as well. And there's something about that, right? So they've got on the screen, uh, we've got things like uh, elderly care, and it's like during COVID, was your grand getting food? Was she getting her deliveries because she couldn't go out? We've got things like uh, food poverty, which you know, we're all reading about, we're probably all seeing food banks um, in every location. And clearly there's a climate crisis going on too. There's a whole range of issues that are societal and it's environmental, but impact us all, and by the way, your employees care about this stuff. So there's something about purpose, which is different to the, to the world we've been in before. Um, and it's not just me saying it, it's, it's clever people, like PwC and Deloitte saying um, some pretty amazing things. And this is, this is from a study that was during lockdown, an unprecedented rise in the loyalty from employees for the for their organisations to get purpose right for their employees. So this is not, not me, the clever people at Deloitte uh, saying stuff, stuff like this. Um, and they were saying it based on things like employees getting it right, getting it right during lockdown about the support they provided their employees, which is huge, by the way, massive pat the back to all of you, because that's, that's, uh, that was one of the great findings from uh, purpose. And I don't want to like hijack this statement from Deloitte to say, hey, purpose means saving the world and doing loads of eco good and social good. This was about getting it right in your organisation about having purpose in my job. So that's number one. Can you have purpose in your job? And I'm not, I'm not here to talk about that today, but I'm sure many of you think about how you create purpose in everyone's job at work. That was number one and, and what was going on really behind this statement. But there's something else going on which I will talk about, which is 
this stat, so almost two-thirds of millennials um, consider ESG, environmental and social stuff, when looking at jobs. So that's huge, that's like two-thirds, two-thirds of what is almost 50% of the workforce today will be 75% of the workforce by 2025 care about environmental and social good. The good news about that is it's kind of coinciding with like boards having ESG targets. So there's something, something cool going on about em employees care about it, boards really should care about it, and almost, um, almost all of them will have to care about it relatively soon, I think. So right now we've got, I guess, listed companies having targets on ESG, which flow from board into the rest of the organization, and I'm sure many other companies beyond listed companies will get into having these kind of targets in the, in the fairly um, uh, uh, near, near future. So there's two, two things going on which I think coincide really, really nicely. Well, if I can do this. Um, also on the financial side, so if you can connect people with your purpose, uh, there's a, a, a very nice financial upside, which is great, more on the finance stats, but um, I, kind of, I kind of will breeze past them a little bit. And then um, this is a, Fairly massive stat too. So uh, I'll read this one for the ones that folks in the back. So 86% uh, of millennials will take a pay cut to work for an organisation that aligns more with its values than other places. And again, this is a fairly massive stat. And if I go, I'm in my 40s, but if I go back to my 20s, that kind of stuff was really rare. Really, really rare, right? So people leaving for a job that paid them less. Um, but it's happening. And if I, if I try and tune it back into the stats we had before, Seven out of 10 people ready to quit. One in four actually quitting and quitting for jobs, sorry, quitting for actually having no job. It's happening, it's really happening. And um, the last couple of hires we've made in on hands, people that have done that, they've left work having no job to go to. And they're doing things that in, when I was you know, 20 years ago, you wouldn't consider doing. They're moving back in with their parents. The, the world shifted in a way that's kind of really hard to get your head around. But when you start considering those kind of things, this kind of stat starts making a difference. So all of a sudden, doing good in the ESG is like, it's like table stakes. Um, and the really clear direction we're seeing, and it's again another Deloitte study, uh, the really clear direction we're seeing is employees want to do good. Uh, the stat on the stat, again, for the folks at the back, the, the stat on the screen is 80% of employees want to do more in their community. So the, again, this was a, a Deloitte stat um, from a 2020 um, study. What, so that's great news, 80% um, of people want to do more. The same study found that the majority of um, employees didn't think their companies were doing enough. Um, and it's not, it's not that companies aren't giving like, time off for folks to, to do good, and many of your companies probably do that already, and actually like 70% of the FTSE 100 give paid off time for people to volunteer. The thing that came back from the study was, yes, I believe my employers are doing something about it, but they're not doing enough, and they're not doing enough because it's still really hard to find the opportunities, and it's really hard to fit it into my working life. So yes, I want to do more, but I can't do it, my employer's not doing enough, uh, came out of that study. Um, at the same time, you've got this going on. So you've got employees wanting to do more in the local community, and you've got things like climate anxiety going, going crazy. So, Again, 60% uh, of people aged uh, 16 to 25 are feeling a sense of loss, hopelessness, and frustration at what they can or can't do about a climate crisis. Um, and that's probably not too surprising. It's like, how do you, how do, you do something about it? Uh, but you've got that combo of things. You've got now social good, people wanting to do more and thinking their employees don't do enough about it. And you've got climate anxiety uh, becoming this real and growing trend, especially in our younger, de younger demographics. Um, so what can we do about it? Um, and I'm going to show you some stats about on hand now. And hello, mum. <laughs> <laughs> it's him. No. Uh, um, so I'm going to show you some stats about um, on hand now, and it's uh, it's kind of like what we what I think well, one of the reasons we're presenting today is it's like what are we able to achieve when we get it right? Um, and so with with the organisations we've worked with, what we've found is trying to tune into those issues. So trying to tune into social good and eco good and wanting to do more, and wanting to do more on eco initiatives too. Um, we're able to get really high, really high engagement stats. So oh, well, how do you do it? Um, so we, first I'll do the stats. So we get like 50% download rates, and this is within the first 90 days. We get incredible repeat rates of people who do stuff, really want to do more good stuff, 
we get incredible crossover between doing eco and social good or vice versa. So if you get your employees starting to do social good in their local communities, they're really likely to take some eco action as well. Um, and a stat we don't speak massively about is the well-being side of things too. So almost everyone reports feeling much better about themselves by doing good. So it's not just about helping someone else, it's about helping yourself too. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we get those stats, a bit about the, uh, I guess, the science behind it. Um, Left side of the that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can master a laptop. Um, so we get these kind of stats uh, because we're trying to make volunteering uh, and doing eco good like as cool as using Netflix or as cool as using Tinder or as cool as using Deliveroo. So how do you make things for your team as easy as like the stuff they just do every day anyway, right? So um, if you can't see it at the back, it's like uh, on the left hand side, it's uh, based on your exact location, it's on demand, you just scroll through just like using Uber or something. You can see your, your, your impacts instantly, so um, you might not be able to see this, but it's got like, oh, I've got a tree count here, I've got a count of how many emissions I've done, I've got CO2E reduction, um, that's tracked instantly uh, based on when I take the actions. It's all gamified, so you can unlock badges again, it's like, it's just, just getting you into well, how do I make this like something I already do in other apps I use. And then there's uh, a bit more gamification. There's a leaderboard here. I will point out on the leaderboards, I'm third. I probably can't read this. I'm third. I'm no longer third. I'm top. And it's not because I'm competitive. No, I'm really competitive. But <laughs> um, it's kind of, kind of fun. So how do you get people engaged in doing, doing exciting stuff? Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So um, on the on-demand side of stuff, it's um, I guess it's different to how folks have typically done volunteering in the past and we've really thought about how to get people engaged and so it's not I'm just going to volunteer and hear lots of opportunities it's volunteering that can be done wherever you are so based on your exact location can I find someone to volunteer with and um, that's number one so it's based on your exact location and number two is how do you make it doable so again one of those Deloitte complaints was yes my company gives me time off but I can't take half a day off or a full day off to go and do some great activity because I'm just so busy well, how do you make it 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or not even any time? The not even any time example is, well, I'm doing my own shopping because I need to live and I, I go and buy my own shopping. Well, how about I do my neighbor's shopping who's, who's housebound and by the way, will we'll identify someone who lives behind you or in the street next door or whatever uh, on the app. So it's really making it, um, I guess, super flexible when you want to do it and uh, micro, micro so it fits in, actually fits in with your life. Uh, that's the idea. And then on EcoGood, it's stuff like this, it's, um, you won't be able to read this, but there's a whole bunch of easy climate positive lifestyle pleasures we have on the app. It's, it's stuff, it's not, it's not trying to be rocket science, it's stuff we all know we should be doing. Um, washing your clothes at a lower temperature, hanging them to dry rather than using the dryer, uh, cycling or, or, or getting public transport to work. And you know, one I love on the screen is the Coffee Monster, it's, it's user takeaway, sorry, user re reusable cup when you're getting your takeaway coffee twice a week. And not just that, we put in the exact CO2E reduction you'll get from that, and then we track that individually for you. And the employer level, you see the whole, uh, the whole impact, which is, which is kind of cool. So those are kind of examples of um, how we do it and why the stats get to, you know, 50% of people download this, 90% of people repeat, 70% of people cross over from doing eco to social good. So it's, it's, how, you get, it's how you get giant stats. Um, and then lastly, um, how do you encourage this kind of thing in your organization and, and get uh, great traction? Um, no rocket science points here. First point is really obvious one. You've got to have senior leader, leadership buy-in to do this kind of stuff. Uh, where you do, um, fantastic. You, you very like to see giant increases in people taking part in these kind of programs. Even if you can get leaders involved just at the start, um, we've got a great example of uh, a PLC, soft cap PLC, where the CEO just, just went out and did a whole load of missions really early. He was top of their leaderboard for about six months, but because of that, the whole organization just followed him. He hasn't done anything since. <laughs> but um, because of that, it's just massively ingrained that they'll do, do more. I think I'll, I'll, alongside this, I'll say, if you can't get senior, senior leadership buy-in to things like you know, purpose, that's also a choice, right? So it's like, which battles do you fight? And if you're not gonna get senior leaders involved, okay, you've got to, you've got to win at something else, and maybe it's not purpose. By the way, money doesn't doesn't do it anymore. It's not it's not the only thing. Seeing people quit um, to take lower salaries, so it's you know you, you yeah it's, it, you've got a different problem. But um, okay. Um, uh, second point is on micro and flexible options to get people involved. Um, lots of you probably have volunteering policies in place right now and probably give time off to your employees. 
Um, you might need to tweak that slightly, right? So how do you get, um, so lots of policies today will say, hey, you get one or two days off a year. Well, how do you accommodate this, this flexible stuff that might be 15 minutes once a week or half an hour every two weeks or whatever it is? How do you build that into your policy? If you, if you need a policy, you can download load one from our site. Um, it, you know, fairly easy to tweak your, your policies to accommodate. Uh, it not being a one day a year kind of thing, it can be, can, can be spread over uh, lots of time. Uh, next tip is on um, setting up volunteering and impact committees. Again, many of you probably have a volunteering committee. You might have a green team and you might have a well-being team as well. My thing on that is, well, how can you combine them? How can you combine volunteering with green? Why aren't, why aren't they actually a combined team versus two separate teams in different locations or involving different people? Um, and the whole point around that is the new kind of um, board level objectives will be around ESG, environmental and social governance, right? So how do you bring those two, two things together? It may take you getting more execs involved to bring them together. You know, if, you've got, if you've got separate volunteering teams and you've got separate green teams made up of employees in your organization, you probably need something that binds them together, otherwise they'll just clash a bit, maybe. So um, there's a little tip on bringing them together. Well-being is also part of this journey. So doing social good should be part of your well-being strategy or should be considering it as part of your well-being strategy. I'm, I'm, you know, I, think, I think people's mindset on well-being has massively progressed from just, the, just 12, 24 months ago, right? Um, so if you're thinking about well-being, you've got various different pillars, where does social play, social well-being, where does that play within your well-being strategy? And again, how do you bring that in with your volunteering team and your green team as well at the same time? Um, and the last bit is um, celebrate and share what your team is doing. Um, and to illustrate it all, I'll just share my last slide, which is a lovely bunch of, um, lovely bunch of selfies. And um, the network effect of doing good and sharing is just huge. And so I'll point out, and folks in the back won't be able to see it, but on the top left there's, there's a, a lady called Sarah who works for Newcastle Building Society up in the northeast, and she's walking a dog. And she's walking uh, an older lady's dog who's like housebound, and that's cool. She really enjoyed doing that. And when she enjoyed doing that, you know, the person she helped also massively enjoyed that because she loves a dog and hasn't been able to walk her for a while. But not just that. Sarah posted that on social media, which is cool. She used her own social media to post it. Uh, she posted it on LinkedIn. And the voter next door is, is Neil. Neil also works for Newcastle Building Society, and he and five other employees picked up the app for the first time after seeing Sarah post about walking this dog. Um, the network effect of that's huge. It's not about the individual employee, it's not about the team, it's about your whole organisation actually beyond that as well. Um, so massively encourage that kind of social sharing if you can, if you can do it. And it's like, you know, it's as simple as using Slack or Teams or whatever it is and having an impact channel where you share stuff. Obviously you've got to get people doing stuff before you can share it, but get them sharing. Um, I, I, I'll keep going a bit here because it's, it's like the illustration of this is, is kind of nuts. So on screen, as well as some lovely selfies, there's some weird photos. There's a, there's two photos that are washing machines. Um, and this is kind of nuts, like people want to do good and they want to share it, right? So we've got uh, various missions on the app um, and one was um, cool clothes, wash your clothes at a lower temperature. Uh, weren't expecting to get any selfies from washing clothes at a lower temperature, but we've got hundreds of photos of people's washing machines set to lower temperatures. And it just kind of illustrates, like we weren't expecting photos for it, but people want to share the good they're doing. So kind of utilize that too. If you can get people doing good, you've really got to encourage the sharing. If you encourage the sharing, you'll get that network effect, and then how can you get to you know, that 50% engagement level with 90% of people repeating? Yeah, it's, do it's really doable. Um, hope this has been helpful. Uh, that's me. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Um, so if anyone has any questions, I think what the easiest thing to do is you pop your hand up, and we'll bring the microphone over to you so everyone can hear the question. And then Sanjay, if you're happy to answer. Yeah, of course. Any questions? Yes, sir. So where, what, where did the original idea come from? What, what, what drove you? Is there a founding story there? Thanks. So, um, yeah, there is. There's a great, great story behind it. Um, I, uh, as Joe explained, so I, I worked for tech companies a long time, um, and I quit my last big role back in 2017. Wasn't really planning on working full time 
again, as, you know, anyone who's worked in tech, it's, it's been a privileged, privileged place to work for the last. Oh, sorry, that sounds really arrogant. Sorry, sorry, that sounds like a bit of a prick. <laughs> Don't mean to sound like a bit of a prick. Don't do that in your when you're speaking. <laughs> Damn. Um, but anyway, it wasn't my idea. It was the idea of a bunch of charities, people like the Red Cross, um, uh, RNIB, Water Aid, who kind of realised recruiting people into volunteering had got really tough. They were only attracting a certain demographic. Definitely weren't getting a younger demographic, and it was because. They required you to volunteer and commit to volunteering at the same time every week for the next six months, do 10 weeks of training, but uh, you know, it's just disastrous on how you recruit. Um, and so it was their idea, how do you make volunteers super flexible, on demand, mobile first? And I at the time was struggling a bit with my dad, who lived in London, I live in Brighton. He was just getting to the age where he couldn't do his own shopping and was just struggling carrying a big Parkinson's. Um, and he was lucky, he had professional carers who lived on site who were doing his shopping for him. And professional carers are great, but they do cost a lot of money. And so his weekly shop went from about £10 a week to £30 a week, including VAT and all that kind of stuff. And it, it just didn't quite feel right. And so when I heard about the idea the charities has, I, you know, I went from not wanting to work to working seven days a week on it, kind of thing. Do you have a follow-up? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so where do the activities that people can volunteer for come from? Do they come from individuals or do they come from charities themselves? Thanks. So um, uh, a bit of both. So uh, people like Red Cross, one of the founding charities, they, they started referring to us really early on. Um, and as they, uh, I guess, were really happy with the way it works, they told Age UK and NHS teams and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we get a lot of direct referrals as well. I guess that's on the elderly side, and then we, we work with other organisations like um, we work with um, Service and Sewage for a while on um, like Beach River Park City kind of cleanups, and then Youth Group and others on youth mentoring. So that it's just spread it's spread to a whole range of different issues. Um, it's a really good initiative, by the way. Um, is this app available on a global level? Is my first question. <laughs> Hi, uh, so uh, right now it's UK only, but uh, we work with about 150 organisations at the moment and so many of them have said, well, when are you getting to France, Spain, Germany, US and whatever else? So in June, we go international. Okay. Hmm. And then my second question was, um, I know it's all, it looks like obviously a lot of it's on an individual level, but where, where or is there any availability for corporate kind of volunteering days when you want multiple people to go on the expansion. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we do, um, there's, there's loads, I think the bits I was showing were about the individual. There's loads we do on the, the group side as well. So um, uh, examples, we do like eco cleanups, river, beach, park, team, team litter picks kind of thing. Uh, we do food, food runs, so you could do like a food prep for homelessness folks or some warehouse work for food banks. Uh, we do things like um, lots of lunch and learn sessions on loneliness and training on dementia friends as a group. And then we do lots of um, competition based stuff. So the CO2 um, reductions, that lends itself really well to having teams compete against each other on which team can reduce the amount of, most amount of CO2 a year over you know, six months a year or whatever it is. So yeah, loads, loads that you can do on the uh, group based stuff as well. Unfortunately, I missed the beginning of the presentation, so if I repeat something that has already been answered, probably. But I was just curious, is there a typical size of businesses that work with you? Oh, yeah, so um, we work with like, a whole range of different sizes. So I think the smallest organization that works with us is literally two employees, and the largest is um, multiple families. So we yeah, have huge, huge difference in uh, who works with us, but we have the most paid for <laughs> um, do you find that you have a good balance between the number of people who are and the number of volunteers versus the number of volunteers? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. So um, it's, it's really difficult to get it right. So we've, we've always had to have more, more volunteers and opportunities. It's, if someone like Red Cross um, comes along and says, hey, we've got someone who's being discharged from hospital, we've really got to have someone who can, who can go and do our duty. So we've always tried to get more volunteers than we have opportunities. There's always tons of gap uh, folks to do. We'll try to hold out a whole bunch of things that are unlimited and um, 
again, you might need some examples of things that are like food bank drops, so a whole bunch of things that are unlimited. So wherever you are, you can see stuff, but then you can try and make sure we we'll put someone like Red Cross on the front just to try and make sure you know what's You speak about uh, little changes that people can make to help the environment that we could all can make. What would you say is the single biggest thing that every one of us in this room could do to help the environment today? Wow, no pressure on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the, the one thing, hey, uh, the one thing, um, so I guess a couple of things come to mind. One, one is, uh, it's on the app, but it's, it's eating less meat, right? So um, it's been, become, uh, like a, a year ago, two years ago, that would have been incredibly unpopular to say, but I think increasingly people are recognizing meat consumption is like dramatic on the environment. Um, I guess flying is the other one. So these are really ugly things to be saying. You know, gee, uh, you know, flying, flying is really painful. And um, I love fucking traveling. I love traveling. So um, flying and you know, I, I guess being being more responsible about that. Number one, being responsible about um, meat consumption is number two. Yeah, or vice versa. What do you think? No, I agree. I definitely for meat. I agree with meat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't eat them not eat meat. <laughs> but I agree. With you. <laughs> no, it's what I say, it's what I say. I do eat, I do eat meat, but I feel bad about it. <laughs> and, and start with small stuff, right? So it's, it's like, how do you go vegan or vegetarian twice a week? You know, how, do you, how do you just do that, right? It's, it's how do you... I'm probably similar, so I'm, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I'm... Uh, I guess. Flexitarian. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think I'll get there. I think I'll get there like full time. Is that a thing? Full time? Yeah. Um, but but it's it's making that switch and how do you get started? I found milk really hard, really hard. But I've made I've made the switch. Um, I guess I'd say the biggest yeah. Okay, good. On the topic of the great resignation, um, so CHROs obviously have a huge responsibility and they need to make some changes. Obviously, well not obviously, but culture is a big one. But what other kind of maybe two things do you think they need to take a look at in order to reverse it? Yeah, the big one on the great resignation. <laughs> Um, so I think number one on the Great Resignation is it's purpose at work, and purpose at work doesn't mean the stuff I've been doing. It's, it's what is meaningful in your job, um, and how do you make every job meaningful at work? Uh, so that's number one. Number one is like having purpose in the work you do, not you know eco stuff and volunteering. It's in the work you do. Is that meaningful or not? If it's not, <laughs> problem on Great Resignation. Um, the second thing um, is look at the trend and um, what I mean by that is it's not it's it's, it's not like do a pulse survey, a survey across your organization sorry if anyone is like that's the kind of thing they sell sorry <laughs> um, it's more who's resigning who's resigning and from which teams are they resigning or what demographic are they in and there's likely to be a trend and we saw it in our hands there was definitely a group that was more affected than others and so like, what the hell's going on over there let's go and fix that so it's not the overall it's which particular demographics or areas in your business are resigning more than others. Have a look at that. Cool, did I, did I answer all okay there? <laughs> uh, on those resignations, as you mentioned, there would be the trends. What about people that cannot afford to leave and they will stay and the resentment, the resentment for example, sometimes it's to have a lever rather than keeping someone in the organization that would be, you know, hating what they're doing in the first place? Yeah, great question. So, um, uh, so if you've got folks in your organization who really don't like being there, that's a, di that's a different problem, right? So um, I guess I, I've always worked in tech companies that have been fairly, mercenary is not the right word, but they've been fairly dramatic on who's want to work out in this company and who's not. And I'm not saying every company's got the luxury of having that, that kind of choice, but um, if, you're an, if your employee is unhappy at work, there's something you've got to address about that. It's either what's going to make the employee happy in work, or will they ever be happy in this environment if uh, this is the organization? 
and there's something harsh that happens along either spectrum, harsh to change why they're going to be happy, or harsh that says, actually, this isn't the right organization. And I guess I've grown up in that tech world that's been, mercenary is the right word, it is the right word. It's, it, I've grown up in that tech organization where things, um, things work out probably best for both parties, where you decide, actually, this is not the right environment for me as an individual, um, or the organization decides this isn't the right, the right employee for the, the, for the organization we are, because we can't change as fast as they need or to give them the things they need, or it's too far gone, whatever, whatever it is. Um, that's really, really harsh for you, but... Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, just very quickly on that. Uh, so, usually when there are projects taken in such a large very, I'm oh sorry, different approaches are taken in those situations and usually they are very negative for either of sides. Yes, it's either an organization or that employee that will be losing them. Uh, but it's more about having a conversation and providing support uh, to the employee with finding another job that will be meaningful and purposeful for them if they don't find the current one as such. Um, I just find this doesn't really happen and no one is brave enough to approach an employee saying that I can see it's not something that's working out for you or us. Yeah, so I'll add to that. So in the uh, tech world I've grown up in, and most organizations I work for are fairly mercenary about their approach to the, what, what's going to work and what's not going to work. What works is they're really transparent about it. So in the environment where, hey, it's not going to work for you, and you might not be here. Um, it, it was just transparent to the whole organization that that was going to work out like with a number of employees that came into the organization. Not everyone was going to work out in this environment. Um, and so, whilst I say it was mercenary, it was really transparent to the whole organization. And that, that, made, it, that made it work. So I think if anyone else has any questions, Sanjay, I'm sure would be very happy to answer sort of in a more quiet zone and likewise if you have a question that you don't want to sort of ask in front of everyone else I'm sure we'll be very happy to answer those otherwise I just want to give another quick round of applause for Sanjay. <laughs> and I believe we have plenty more food and drinks so please continue to enjoy your evenings. Thank you very much.